Today is Tuesday, September 22, 2015. I'm Barbara Costa. As part of the MIT Infinite History Project, we're talking with Dr. Sally W. Chisholm, also known as Penny. Dr. Chisholm is the Lee and Geraldine Martin Professor of Environmental Studies and Professor of Biology at MIT. She joined the MIT faculty in 1976. She is the principal investigator at the Chisholm Lab at MIT, which studies the role of cyanobacterium prochlorococcus in the ocean's metabolism. Discovered by Dr. Chisholm and her colleagues in 1988, prochlorococcus is the most abundant photosynthetic microorganism in the oceans. Her research is devoted to developing prochlorococcus as a model system for advancing our understanding of the ecology and evolution of marine microbes. Dr. Chisholm has a bachelor's degree from Skidmore College, and she received her PhD from SUNY Albany. She is an MIT Institute professor and a recipient of, of the 2011 National Medal of Science. Thank you for talking with us, Professor Chisholm. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so if we want to start way back when, uh, we often start with growing up. And what was it like to grow up in Marquette, Michigan? on Lake Superior? Uh, it was a great childhood. Uh, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but uh, we go back there now. We have a, actually have a cabin on the lake now, so I go back and relive my childhood. But um, it was idyllic, um, sort of. We played on the lake in the summer, and we skied all winter. And um, we only went to school through junior high and high school because it was the baby boom era there weren't enough schools, so they split the sessions. So I went to school in the morning in junior high and the afternoon in high school and, uh, and skied the rest of the day. So it was, uh, it was really a, a, a wonderful place to grow up. Was the water an important part of, uh, since you were on the lake? Well, we, I, we just assumed that the rest of the world was like that. I mean, that was our world. Just So yeah, it was an, you know, an important part of our, our uh, activities there. Um, but uh, it didn't really influence, I don't, didn't have an influence on the direction of, of my career, I don't think. But Or an environmental awareness or anything like that? Um, no, I, I think I just was growing up. I was just a kid growing up. I, I just, uh, I didn't have great plans for my, for my life at all <laughs> at that point. But the 60s must have been interesting. Was that anything particular, the, um, that time period? Was there something, was that challenging or interesting? I think, yeah, I think I picked up on, my mother was a, a, a traditional, like, 50s housewife. And um, I think in the 60s I picked up on her unrest and that her, her life was, you know, not as fulfilling as, it might have been. She was a really smart woman and, and artistic, and um, and she she as we my I had an older brother, so as we grew up, we were in high school. Um, she started getting into other activities, and I think was was getting getting swept into the early feminist era then, and so that that I think had an influence on me. And so then you graduated from Marquette Senior High School, and did you immediately know what you wanted to do next? No, I didn't. In fact, I had no ambition <laughs> at all. I, I actually wanted to be, a, I thought I wanted to be a medical technologist. I, I knew I liked laboratories. I, I, I liked test tubes, and, and, and I liked going to school, but I, I, I didn't really think about um, what was going to happen next, and but my parents um, kind of made it clear that I was going to go to college and go to a four-year college uh, all the way along. So I knew that's what I was supposed to do. So so that's that's what I did, um, and uh, applied to a number of colleges. Um, I, I, at the, and I only got into Skidmore and um, and the University of Colorado. And I was really interested in skiing. And I, I would have gone to the University of Colorado, but my father convinced me. He said he'd buy me a car if I went to Skidmore. Uh, so, so that was what made my decision. Um, and also, my brother was at Dartmouth. And I think that made it easier to, to go east, because I'd never been there, never uh, visited it or anything. It was just uh, uh, it was an adventure. 
And then, so once you were there, was it pretty quickly that you became interested in, in uh, marine biology? Well, no, actually, I started as a math major. I had done, I'd done well in math in, in high school, uh, but realized that college math is very different than high school math. <laughs> and, um, and I liked my biolo introductory biology class, and so I um, switched to becoming a biology major my sophomore year. Um, but I, you know, still didn't, I didn't really realize or think about what I wanted to do after, um, after college. I was just getting through the years. <clears throat> and so oh, even all through college, the marine yeah. biology, when, where did the well, marine? Well, my, my senior year, I did independent study. And my, my advisor was, uh, stu studied um, lakes and plankton. So that's when I, I started getting interested in, and I remember the first time I looked through a microscope and saw plankton from lakes. I thought that, that was pretty cool. And, um, and he, he was the one that, and I didn't, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, he was the one that said, you could get a PhD if you want. And it never occurred to me that I could get a PhD. I mean, this was, you know, in the, in the late 60s. And, and also, my, I came from a family that was very business-centered. Um, so academic life was not part of our, my, my world, except for one of my close friends growing up. Her father was the vice president of the local university. So I remembered, you know, hanging around their house was pretty interesting. Um, so when, you know, when he said you could get a PhD, I thought, well, I wasn't sure I wanted to get a job, so that <laughs> seemed to be a good option. So that's that's what um, what made me go on. Enough to that you school. knew straight what you wanted to do. Um, well, because you have to specify. Yeah, I actually uh, I started. Um, I knew I was interested in ecology, and um, you know, my advisor helped me find people that worked in limnology and ecology. And, uh, and I actually started at, at graduate school at Cornell, but I was, I was in love at the time and <laughs> ended up only, only staying there for a year and came back uh, to be with that person. And um, so that, then I, that's how I ended up at State University of New York at Albany, because it was near, near the Saratoga Springs area, which is where Skidmore is. And then I, I, so I, then I, at Cornell I was studying more chemistry in, in lakes and it was at Albany that I switched to, uh, to phytoplankton, which became my trajectory, but still in, in lakes. Uh, and, um, and it was only after that that I got into oceanography as a postdoc. How was the transition made from lakes to oceans then? Uh, that was big. <laughs> it was, uh, um, I realized, I realized after gra in, in graduate school that a lot of the funding was really in oceanography and that not in lakes, um, which is really too bad uh, because there's a lot of really interesting research to be done in lakes. But at that time, the Navy was funding a lot of oceanographic research and a lot of funding, um, funding a lot of research on plankton, um, you know, for strategic military reasons in terms of sensing submarines and things in the oceans. And um, so they were funding basic research, though, on, on plankton in the oceans. So there was a lot more um, research funding in that field. And, uh, and so I had an opportunity to go to Scripps Oceanographic Institution um, for my postdoc, which really, really launched my, uh, my career, in a sense. That was, the, but I but I didn't know anything about the oceans. I hadn't even, I'd only been to the oceans about twice before that. Um, so I, it was a steep learning curve to to make that transition. And did you have specific mentor mentors that were important to you early in your career? Anybody come to well, mind? Well, my advisor at um, Skidmore certainly, uh, who. Um, was one that suggested that I get a PhD. Um, and I had a couple of teachers in high school who I just went to my 50th high school reunion. And um, 
and they, both of them were there. Two math teachers uh, were there, and I had the opportunity to thank them for um, because that the, they stood out. And there were a, you know, a f I, I always say it's it, all it takes is a few good teachers in in high school or junior high. To um, there was also a, a science teacher in junior high um, who, you know, had a had an influence on me and. Uh, and they, you know, that that was enough. Even though the school system was sort of in crisis, since we <laughs> were only in school for a half a day both times, and it was, it was very overcrowded and everything. But a few good teachers can can go a long way. So, um, so that that was in in those years that they they were very helpful. And then my my postdoc mentor um, was also very. He, he took a huge chance, I think, in taking me, sort of an un unknown uh, person from limnology. Uh, and so he, he was very supportive in getting me to Scripps and sort of launching my career there. Um, but he retired, actually, soon thereafter. So um, it, it, you know, that, that was, that influence sort of stopped after after he retired, but I had another mentor there um, <clears throat> at Scripps, who's who was just brand new on the staff. Um, his name was Farouk Azam. My my other mentor was was uh, Dick Epley, um, and Farouk Azam had a had a big influence on the way I do science. He was he worked we worked together at the bench and did experiments together, and um, I've always been grateful for his influence. When did you start going out of of the lab into on cruises or whatever it was that got you out into the field of the ocean. Uh, that well, when I was working on lakes, we we did a lot of field work, but that would, those would just be day trips in the. Um, and I spent one summer in, in Point Barrow, Alaska, working on ponds there, which was really an interesting experience. But at Scripps, I started uh, my first cruise was two months after I got there. It was in uh, the Gulf of California, Baja, for a month. It was a really incredible experience um, to to be able to do that, and we went on pretty much um, monthly cruises off the coast of, of of California. So I jumped in pretty quickly to the cruising lifestyle, which and at that time uh, it was just beginning. Uh, women on ships was it was just beginning to be allowed. They hadn't quite sorted it all out yet. Um, so you would be the only one? Uh, sometimes, yeah. Um, but it was just starting. It was, it was just opening up for, for women to go on cruises. But um, it's, and it wasn't anything like, I mean, today there are women crew members and, you know, it's all very, very mixed. And, uh, but it, in those days it was, it was an interesting, plus it was the 70s, you know, it was, it was the 70s. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> a pretty wild time. Um, so uh, we 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 had a good time, and and um, and I must say that the people that I worked with at Scripps were were very open to women, you know, being treated as equals and um, and being part of the part of the scene. So. Still a month at sea as the only woman. Or anyway, what what was the what's the time like when you were out for a month? What was what did you do? Uh, boy, well, it there was cruises are different. So they have different qualities. Some some of the, the the monthly cruises were 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 very monitoring cruises. So there's a lot of routine around the clock, just collecting samples, doing the same analysis, collecting more samples, doing the same analysis. You know, trying to get it more efficient. Um, and um, but but there's a, you know it was always it was a good crowd of people and a lot of camaraderie and and um, you know I enjoyed it a lot and then some of the other cruises you could actually collect samples and do experiments and do science um, as you would in the lab and so those were were more stimulating intellectually um, and they they have different qualities with different missions but but. 
it was it was a great a great time. Um, it How was many a great were place. there? How many missions? Like while you were a uh, postdoc? As a postdoc? Um, oh, I probably went on about five d different cruises. Over what um, period of time? Over mm -hmm. two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was. I learned a I learned a lot. I learned everything I know about oceanography from from those cruises and, and some that came afterwards when I when I came here. And then could you describe um, the Prochlorococcus and what's special about it? It Prochlor I would say Prochlorococcus has has great charisma because it has all kinds of superlatives attached to it. It's the it's the smallest photosynthetic cell on the planet. Um, it's less than a micron in diameter. Um, and so it, it's the, and it's got the smallest number of genes of any photosynthetic plant. So I would say it's, it's the smallest amount of information that can convert carbon dioxide into living organic matter using only solar energy. Um, but it's so, so. But it's the so. It's the smallest. It's the most abundant, um, and of course, from my point of view, the most interesting <laughs> of of small. Um, they're called picoplankton in the oceans. Actually, if we could step back. I just want to. I should have asked first about the discovery. Ah, yes. Well, when when I first came to MIT, I I was studying a group of phytoplankton called diatoms, and they're um, single-celled, um, but they're about 30 microns in diameter, and um, and they're very abundant in lakes and oceans, and uh, many different species of them. And we were studying a single species. We were trying to understand how it grew uh, and responded to the light and the dark cycle, the daily rhythm of light and dark, since since uh, these guys are limited by solar energy and. But I was always frustrated that that um, that we could study them in the lab in cultures, but we couldn't count on finding them out in the field if we went on a cruise. That a particular species, you couldn't say, "Well, I, this is what I know about it in the lab. Now I want to go study it where it lives," um, because there's so many different species, and you never know when they're going to bloom. And and so that was kind of frustrating. And um, but it, but we kept working at it, and we were interested in the cell division cycle. Um, and you could study that by staining the DNA and the nucleus and, and seeing when, when the nucleus replicated itself. And so the, the stained uh, nucleus would, uh, these cells replicate by dividing in half. So you'd see two nuclei and then you know that cell is about ready to divide. And, and so to, to study that, we were using an instrument called a flow cytometer that is a laser-based instrument that's used in, in cell biology research and hospitals, biomedical research to study cell division in cancer cells and other things. And so we couldn't afford a big flow cytometer, so we actually, I had a postdoc who, who was very clever and he built one based on microscope uh, setup. And so we used that, but when we, at the same time, around 1979, that was, uh, I came to MIT in 76, um, a colleague in Woods Hole discovered these tiny little cells in, in, in the oceans, they're called Sinecococcus, um, that were very abundant and, and had a pigment that fluoresced uh, orange when, when you shine blue light on them. So we realized that, that this flow cytometer that we'd been using to study cell division could be a really powerful tool to study those microorganisms in, in the oceans because they autofluoresce, they, their pigments autofluoresce. And, and in fact, it would be useful to study all the phytoplankton. So we started just shooting seawater through the instrument um, and saw you know, all of these, the, the, the laser is focused on this little capillary tube. And when the cell goes through, and then you inject the cells, and the cell goes through the laser, it scatter, the cell scatters light, and the pigments fluoresce a color, depending on what pigment you see. And so it turned out that this instrument that was designed for cell biology was pretty interesting in terms of oceanography. So, so we, we got a grant to buy one, 
with a money back guarantee that if it didn't work on a ship, they would take it back. Um, and one, this one very clever postdoc, Rob Olson, who, who had designed this homemade flow cytometer, uh, had the courage to actually put this on a ship. And, um, and so we set out, and it turned out that it was really ideal for studying this Seneca caucus, which was very abundant and everywhere. And so we could, for the first time, just while at sea, count the numbers of these things and look at their properties and how they're distributed with depth and all of that. So well, soon it turned out that, so those cells fluoresce orange, and Rob noticed that there were these tiny little things, even smaller than Sinecococcus, that were fluorescing red, that we thought were, was electronic noise in the instrument, and, um, and kind of ignored for quite a while. And then, but then it started behaving better than noise. <laughs> and it started changing with depth and, you know, so make a long story short, those were per Prochlorococcus, uh, which is smaller than Sinecococcus and fluoresces red instead of orange because it doesn't have the pigment that Sinecococcus has. And so, so that was the discovery. Um, but it turned out that it actually had been discovered twice before, but people didn't know what they had discovered. So, <laughs> so it, we were lucky enough to be able to look at that earlier evidence. There was a picture that had been published and, um, and their pigments had been published, but, but people didn't realize that that was their pigments. And so we were just lucky enough to, put, to be able to put the pieces together, that, that what we were seeing with the flow cytometer was this same pigment that had been observed in seawater and also was the cells that were in a picture that somebody had published of all the different cells in, in the ocean. So, so. And then know. it was everywhere? And it, well, we didn't know it was everywhere then. Um, we, we didn't really realize what we had discovered. I mean, well, we did, but we didn't, didn't realize the magnitude of any of it. And, and in fact, we got more interested in sort of understanding its evolutionary. Uh, we thought um, it's well known that higher plant cells uh, have chloroplasts and that those chloroplasts uh, evolutionarily come from uh, cyanobacteria, which is actually what Prochlorococcus is. And those chloroplasts have, higher plant chloroplasts have chlorophyll B and Prochlorococcus, turns out, had chlorophyll B. And so we got excited. We thought, well, maybe this is, you know, sort of the, the it's like a living fossil. Maybe this is the ancestor, closely related to higher plant chloroplasts. And we thought that would be perhaps an interesting uh, story. And um, but it turned out that through molecular phylogeny analysis that it, it isn't any closer, close, more closely related to chloroplasts than, than, than other cyanobacteria. So, so that wasn't an interesting avenue to pursue. So we just kept studying them. And, and, and we didn't have them in culture for quite a while. So we just kept studying their distribution and where they were and how deep they went. And, um, and we'd bring up seawater and add nutrients or change the light intensity and see. Right how, on the spot, you mean? Yeah, right on the ship. We, 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 we would do, that's the only way we could do experiments with them. Um, but because we had a flow cytometer on the ship, you could actually do that, and you could count them independent of everything else. Um, so we could, you know, f we could see how they responded to light shifts and um, and what their growth rates were if you added nutrients and, and and all of that. So we did that for several years before they were finally um, brought into culture. So and again, with the the role of Prochlorococcus. The role of it in the ecosystem. Um, well, they're the they're the the base of the food web. They're because they, they photosynthesize. They they can make biomass just from inorganic compounds and, and CO two, and um, of course they're important in in drawing CO two from the atmosphere into the oceans. Um, they're part of the it's called the the biological pump that draws CO two in and then they get they get eaten as fast as they divide pretty much so their their numbers stay stable out in the oceans 
Um, so much of the carbon they fix gets respired and goes back out again. Uh, but they're an integral part of the machinery of the uh, microbial community in the surface ocean. So I always, they're, they're, there's this thin film of about 200 meters in the surface ocean um, where the sunlight penetrates. And that is where all the photosynthesis goes on. Um, and that's feeding everything all the way down to the thousands of meters depth. Um, that carbon in the ocean, th in the surface waters, is settling down and, and feeding everything in the deep water. Um, so that their, their role is to, I always th is to sort of keep the food web churning. <laughs> Um, and there's also var variability within um, uh, Prochlorococcus, or are they or is there a similarity throughout? Yeah, that's the 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 Prochlorococcus. When we first found them, you know, we thought they were all one thing. Uh, they're I mean, basically they were what we see on the flow cytometer. That's there was this population, and that's Prochlorococcus, and that's still true, um, but. The first two isolates, and the first person to isolate one was Brian Palinick. He was a graduate student here at MIT, or in the joint program with, with Woods Hole. And then soon thereafter, um, colleagues in France isolated one from the Mediterranean Sea. So we had one from the Sargasso Sea that was isolated at 120 meters, and then the Mediterranean strain was isolated in the surface. And so we started measuring their growth rate as a function of light intensity in the lab and saw that they were very different, that the one that was isolated from the deep water could grow at extremely low light intensities, and the one that was isolated from the surface could tolerate much higher light intensities and, and grow faster at, at higher light intensities. So that was the first uh, evidence that you know there's more than one type, and we call them ecotypes, uh, of Prochlorococcus. And as, uh, to fast forward, the, the punchline now is that there's extraordinary diversity. Um, but that was, that's 20 years of work to get there. Um, you referred to, um, to seawater as dissolved information. <laughs> uh, can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, well, so I should, I mean, we, maybe I should backtrack to, to the, the beginning of genomics in the story, because that's, that's where that comes from. Um, where, where would that get you out of sequence? Uh, that's fine. I okay. was going to ask about, um, about the genome sequencing. You want to just tell the whole story? Sure, sure. Uh, because the, the, so we, we, after we realized there were these different ecotypes, we kept isolating more different strains and found that they, they broadly fell into these high light, low light, Groups, but but there was a continuum in between, and they they all had slightly different um, characteristics, and there were also high temperature and low temperature ecotypes. So we, you know, started seeing the the diversity, and then it was around um, 1990, I think. No, was it? I don't remember the first genome, but somewhere around there. I think um, we were lucky enough to be among the first mi microbes to have its genome sequenced because it was so small and the genome was so small that it wouldn't take long, quote unquote, uh, even though it t in those days it took six months, now it takes six hours or something. Um, so we, and we managed to get two, two uh, these two strains, high light and low light, their genome sequenced. and that completely opened up um, uh, the, the, the black box of the, and, and that, that's when also metagenomics was, was entering our field, which is you know, not simply isolating a, well, it took another maybe a decade for metagenomics to get big, but um, so not just isolating different strains and sequencing them, but you take, you take uh, seawater, you filter it, you collect all the microbes and uh, grind it up, chop it up, the, chop up the DNA so that you have it all in these little pieces that are about the size of a gene, but 
they're from all the microorganisms. Um, and then you have to make sense out of that. Uh, but that's what, so, so with the genomics entering the lab and metagenomics entering the field, it kind of started to change the way we, well, when I'd look at the ocean, I would think of all of those microbes and all of the information in their genes. And that's what I started to refer to as dissolved information. It's not really dissolved, but you know, you can't see the, the, the microbes. And, and then you start to think of that that's, that's what's running the, the element cycles of the globe. I mean, it's the information in those microorganisms in their DNA that is, that is bringing CO2 into the ocean and, and oxygen out of the ocean and cycling all the elements and, and doing all the work of the planet. So, so it changes, totally changes the way you, you, you think about it. Um, and so what have we learned and, and, uh, on the genomic level about, about pleuro, um, um, prochlorococcus? Well, it's uh, the fascinating thing for us has been that if you, every time we would se uh, sequence a new genome, which now you can do, you know, just like nothing, um, we now have 45 strains sequenced and, and there will be, you know, another 100 probably in the next uh, year or so. But every time we sequence a new genome, we find, 200 or so genes that we never saw before. So, and if you compare pairwise, every time you sequence a, a new genome, it, you quickly realize that there are about 1,200 genes that all Prochlorococcus share. That's their, the core genome. That's the essence of being a Prochlorococcus cell. That's their basic metabolism. But, but every strain has a unique set of, of genes some of which are shared with others, but some of which are, 200 of which are, are we haven't seen before. So on average, they have 2,000 genes, um, but it, the, the to, it's called the pan genome, the total number of genes in all of Prochlorococcus on the planet um, is now projected, just from our theoretical projections, to be about 80,000 genes, which is, four times the size of the human genome. So, and I don't know, you know, we don't know whether that's really what it is, but um, one of my goals is to actually measure that, is to, is to know <laughs> how many total genes at this moment in time are in a prochlorococcus cell on the planet. And, um, but it represents an extraordinary amount of genetic capability for a, a single, it, it would be considered by traditional mi microbiological standards, it would be considered a single species. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an enormous population that's filled with very diverse uh, subspecies or ecotypes, as we call them, uh, that, and that's what allows it to occupy the vast majority of the, the oceans. So fair, fair to say that genomics has revolutionized the, uh, the research you're doing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and what about, I like the, I'm interested by the interdisciplinary work of your team, and because um, now it's, I'm hearing a lot of genetics, but mm -hmm. what other disciplines are important on your team in your lab or your colleagues? Yeah, I, I, I always think of my lab as almost like a miniature biology department in a sense that we, one of our, our uh, one of the goals for me has been to study the single organism from the genome all the way up to the level of the global biosphere, basically. And I call it cross-scale systems biology. And to do that, you need people who are thinking and trained in, in, in all these different um, fields. and. And I'm not trained even, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a molecular biologist or genomics person, I'm, I'm an ecologist by training. So I would not have gotten into genomics uh, without bright young PhD students trained <laughs> in, actually the, fr the first student on the first genome paper was a, a, a biology department major. Um, so she was, she was a molecular biologist. I mean, she was a, 
she was an undergraduate in the biology department. Um, so, so the team is made up of um, you know microbial ecologists, uh, bioinformatics people, uh, molecular biologists, uh, environmental engineers. Uh, I've had chemists. I've had physicists. Uh, anybody that's interested in Prochlorococcus, I'll take them. Um, so, the it's been a very, very rewarding experience for me to see them work together um, because the organism pulls, unites them. It, it's just, it's really, it's really satisfying to see it happen when they come together around understanding this this single organism and and sort of bond to it. Uh, it, and it works. It works really well. And I couldn't, could not have done what I, you know, what I have done um, at all. I mean, I I would say that, that I, I'm the conductor, and they're the musicians. I mean, I just make sure that the right people are talking to the right people and and find the right teams to to make something happen. So it's civil and environmental engineering with biology, but also much more. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, because to understand it, you need to understand the physics of the ocean. You need to understand chemistry. I've had, I've had people um, w involved in trace metal chemistry, which is very complex and difficult uh, to work with in the oceans because they're, they're vanishingly low concentrations. Um, so to study the effects of trace metals on, on Prochlorococcus is, is really difficult. Um, and I've had students in four or five different PhD programs. There's a joint program with Woods Hole in biology and in chemistry. Uh, there's environmental engineering. There's the biology department. Uh, I've had, I can't even remember, uh, the biology, uh, I can't, I think there's a couple other ones, but I can't remember them, but many different PhD, oh, the microbiology PhD program recently, that's a new PhD program, so, um, which is very cross-disciplinary in the students that it admits. What's the civil engineering side of it? Well, not, it's environmental engineering. I see. Yeah, it's and, and it's really, it's, I mean, it's the civil and environmental engineering department, but we're in the environmental end of it. So Got I it. would say that the, all the, and we're all in the Parsons lab, which is, we're in a separate building, the environmental people. Um, and I think our, even though there are people working in physics, chemistry, uh, fluid mechanics, you know, aquatic chemistry, all the hydrology, all these different fields, but everybody, our worldviews are the same. You know, we're all interested in the natural world and how it sustains human beings. And so, um, it's interesting to see the this very it, interdisciplinary group of graduate students in that in the division. Um, so some of my students are microbiologists or doing genomics, uh, are getting a PhD in environmental engineering, um, and they, you know, they come out sort of with a different profile because they take a lot of more engineering classes and and, and fluid mechanics and other things. Um, so that's that's also interesting to watch the students in the different disciplines interact. What is the Earth System Initiative at MIT? What is is that? Does that get into the Political end of things, or is that about systems? Uh, that that we try. It it no longer exists, but <laughs> but it was a, a labor of love <laughs> for. Uh, um, well, it's actually I should say it's 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 slowly morphed into the new environmental initiative that's recently been launched. Um, but the but that 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 was an initiative that. Uh, a number of us got together, faculty got together, and um, you know felt that MIT could really make a, differ a difference in in uh, advancing our understanding of how the planet works. That, that that the Earth is a complex system made up of you know living creatures uh, and and physics and um, chemistry, and that between the uh, Earth Atmosphere and Planetary Sciences Department and an Environmental Engineering Department and others around the campus that we could, you know, we could put together a, a compelling uh, initiative designed to really understand how the planet works. Um, and so we worked hard to, 
to do that and, and, and succeeded at some, at, at, to some degree at bringing faculty together from different disciplines and things like that. But um, I think that at MIT, we're founded on solving problems. And uh, even though you have to understand a system in order to solve the problems, I think that the environmental initiative will, will be much more focused on, on solving immediate in, environmental problems um, and that these sort of long-term studies of how the earth works will go on, but not as a, a focused initiative. And one other um, piece of what you have been discovering in your work is has to do with viruses. Could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, once we once we understood, uh, got a handle on Prochlorococcus, had it in culture, had the genomes. Um, I decided it was time to move outward and then and work on study their sources of mortality. And we knew we knew that there were viruses in the oceans, and that Cynococcus, his close relative, um, had had viruses that infected it. So um, I had a student. Matt Sullivan, who worked on uh, under the guidance of John Waterbury, who's a colleague at Woods Hole. I should say too that I guess I haven't mentioned how important Woods Hole was in um, my early years at, at MIT, and even I mean the joint the joint program with Woods Hole. I've had graduate students in that in that, and um, and John was 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 very helpful in getting us into the virus uh, field. So we started isolating viruses that infected Prochlorococcus. And then when and genomics was coming into the, the, the lab at that point, so we started sequencing viruses. And we, and at the same time, um, actually before us even, a colleague in, in the UK discovered that viruses carry photosynthesis genes in their, in their DNA, which, and they don't photosynthesize, so they've picked these up from from the host in, during infection. And it turns out that, that the, there are other genes that they carry, that, that like phosphorus acquisition genes, lots of different genes that they carry that they use when they infect the host to redirect the host's metabolism. And um, so That's we- symbiotic? Mm -hmm. Well, no, well, I, it's interesting you should ask that because the classic view of virus-host interaction is that it's predator-prey because the virus injects its DNA and uses the host metabolism to replicate its DNA and then it bursts the host and spreads out all the baby viruses. Um, well, they're not babies, they're just viruses, but uh, <clears throat> they only have one age. <laughs> <laughs> the progeny. Yeah, the progeny, exactly. And so, and that's the way it works with, with Prochlorococcus, but we started to think, you know, that this, since the viruses carry these host genes, that there's good evidence that they're exchanging them back, that they're, they're carrying them, they evolve in the virus, and then they get put back in the host in ways that we don't understand yet. Um, but the virus almost serves as a, a way of creating gene diversity in, in, in some of these genes. And, um, and, and, and the virus also maintains diversity in the populations because they, you know, they will, they will, and this is all speculation. I mean, we don't, we're, there's like three people in the world that work on these viruses. So it's not, it's gonna take a long time to get this nailed down. Um, but it's starting to, the, the, the image that's starting to emerge is the viruses are really part of the system. Um, and yes, that one cell may die, but that cell has daughter cells all over the place that are, genetically identical, um, and that the, that the virus is, is playing a role in the flow of gene exchange and in maintaining the diversity of the populations by, they say, by killing the winner, you know, that if one population is really abundant, the viruses will, will, will reduce those numbers so things are stabilized a little bit. So, um, so it, it's, it's, it's really, in fact, the, the whole field is, is, is of microbial ecology is, is moving in the direction of, of viewing the, the system, the community the, as, a, 
as a living entity rather than a bunch of units that are competing or killing each other or whatever, you know, it, that it's a, it's a, a co-evolved system um, that is very metabolically interdependent. Do you refer to somewhere as ocean as a machine or? Uh, did I? I don't sure. think so. Not sure. I, I, I don't think of it that way. I think of it, it I think of it as an organism. Mm. I think of it as a, um, yeah, as a, as a super organism um, that the, 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 and then the inhabitants have, are finely tuned and co-evolved, um, and that's what gives it its stability. And just to pull back and now talk a little bit about MIT, when, what attracted you to join the MIT faculty in 1976? Oh, well, <laughs> I had uh, finished my postdoc <laughs> and had scripts. You, in those days, you could only be a postdoc for two years because it was so beautiful. It was right on the beach, and everybody would want to stay there forever if they could. So uh, two years, and you had to find a job. So I had to find a job. And so I applied. There was, a, there was an ad in this de department describing somebody that was very much like me. And so I, I decided to apply and um, applied a bunch of other places. and. Uh, got some other offers, but there, I had a, another mentor at Scripps, and he, he had gone to Harvard, and um, he said, you don't turn down MIT. <laughs> so, I mean, I was sort of terrified to come here, but um, so another option was a oceanography department in, in um, Canada, which would have been a much more relaxed lifestyle, um, and a small marine lab in Maine, you know, and. Uh, so I kind of knew, yeah, I w probably shouldn't turn down MIT. But it was an odd fit, you know, civil and environmental engineering department. I was the only biologist. I was the only woman. Um, and that's where the Woods Hole connection was, was, was huge. I mean, I felt there were colleagues there that I knew. And, um, you know, I felt at home with that connection. And so I decided to g give it a shot. Um, and Who were your early mentors or connections that were important? Well, there, in the department, there was a chemist, Francois Morel, um, who is no, no longer here. He went to, to um, Princeton. But, um, and he was breaking into biology. And, so, and he, he saw that that's where the action and the excitement was. Um, and so he had some students working on phytoplankton. And, and so, so the two of us kind of formed a, a group um, and together built over the years uh, w uh, what we called the aquatic sciences group. So that was, you know, uh, I, I was still the only biologist, but there were chemists. And, um, and then in Woods Hole, there, were, uh, there was um, a, a man named Bob Guillard who had maintained a phytoplankton culture collection there that um, was very helpful to us in the, in the beginning. And, and at Harvard, uh, a fellow uh, named Jim McCarthy, who's now a, still a professor there, um, he also he encouraged me to, to take the job because he had been a um, graduate student at Scripps with, with, uh, with my same mentor there. So, so I had a, a few connections that made it, made it welcoming. And how has MIT changed during the time that you've been on the faculty? Any key moments or critical junctures that come to mind? I mean, interestingly enough, my immediate environment, the, my physical environment, has not changed a bit, which is the Parsons lab. <laughs> it's, it's exactly the same building. I was renovated once um, in, in, in over the years, but but certainly MIT has changed uh, dramatically. Uh, Noteworthy, of course, is the number of women, um, number of women students. When I first came in '76, there weren't that many undergraduate women. I mean, there were enough, but it wasn't. They weren't not like now, where it's almost 50 percent. I, I don't know what the percent was, but um, and certainly very few women faculty and and no women administrators at all. Uh, so, so that was. Uh, that's changed uh, dramatically, and but in the last, also in the last, uh, well, since genomics, 
in the last, say, 15 years or so, I think my field has become much more toward the uh, recognized at, at, at MIT. I mean, we really used to be very much in the backwaters. Uh, <laughs> so to speak. Um, yeah, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but uh, genomics and molecular biology as applied to oceanography has has made some of the things we work on so much more tractable that um, that it's become a, a very exciting time in the in the field and and um, and also the f the Moore Foundation um, has poured a tremendous amount of money into marine microbiology and that completely changed my life uh, in in the last fifteen years too I mean it really made made us able to run labs uh, of a critical size and uh, and take risks and do things that we wouldn't have been able to do before just on NSF funding. Is funding difficult or? Um, it hasn't been in the, it, it traditionally always used to be. Um, well, when I first started it wasn't too difficult and we, things weren't that expensive. Um, the Navy was investing a lot in, in basic research in biological oceanography. Um, and NSF had had more money, so it wasn't it wasn't too bad. But um, in the middle years, you know, funding has uh, did uh, start to get harder to get, and and of course you start to build a bigger lab and do more expensive things, and um, so. But you know, I've always always managed to do fine, and. Um, but when the Moore Foundation entered the scene, that's when we really, really could do things. And it was tremendously exciting. Um, and, you know, I could, I could have a, a much larger lab and have these people from diverse disciplines all working on Prochlorococcus. And, um, and most importantly, we could, we could take risks. And, and there's no question that the discoveries we made because of that were because of that kind of funding. I mean, they, they wanted us to take risks. They wanted us to, you know, attack, tackle hard things. And, um, and now the Simons Foundation has, has picked up and they're funding the field. So, uh, so I've just felt incredibly lucky that at this stage of my career, because, you know, fields have these arcs and usually you enter an exciting field when you're young and then, uh, more often than not, it will it will it will pass. It will um, by the time you're in, later in your career, that field's been replaced by something else. For the arc of my career is kind of the uh, the other. It, it sort of the field was just moving along steadily for years, but you know not making many major breakthroughs. Um, but now, toward the tail end of my career, it's just exploding, which is so it's really exciting to. To see that happen, I'll say. Um, and by the way, talking about MIT uh, and the changes over time, could you talk about your participation in the committee that conducted um, the study on the status of women in the MIT Faculty of Science back in the 1990s and 2000s? What was that experience? What brought you into that, and and what was that like at yeah, the time? That was that was extraordinary. I mean, I have to say that was one of the Definitely one of the most memorable periods um, at MIT, and and what started that was Na I mean Nancy Hopkins it was a phone call from Nancy Hopkins saying um, describing something that had happened to her and and saying that you know she she felt the situation for senior women faculty she was focused on um, you know just that they weren't getting their share of the pie. Um, and, and she just started calling. I think there were maybe 13 or 14 of us at the time. And she was focused on the School of Science, but I had a joint appointment in the School of Science, so, she, so I was on her call list. Um, what was your experience before her call? What were you feeling? Well, actually, if, if, I, if I, yeah, I go back, I, when I first came here, I didn't, even though I was the only woman, I mean, I was not and even though there weren't that many women at Scripps, or, I was just one of those people that, you know, I was just doing my work, and I liked being one of the guys, and uh, I didn't, I wasn't plugged into 
feminist issues or anything. You know, I think I enjoyed being surrounded by men. And I mean, I was young and I was single. And, and, um, and so I was just working toward getting tenure and having a good time. Um, and, uh, but then after I got tenure, <laughs> I think um, I... Which was at what point? Uh, so that would have been seven years after 76, so 1983, I guess. And uh, I, I sat in on... Actually, it's interesting. Uh, memories are coming back. There was a group of colleagues that... Li I lived in Newton, and one of my colleagues, uh, Keith Stolzenbach, on the faculty in our department lived in Newton, and they had a carpool. They were all men, and, and they asked me to join their carpool, but they were all married men with kids, and so they were, they were eight to five, and I was young, and I was single, and I said, you know, I'm not going to go home at five o'clock. I, <laughs> I go out and party. So, but they said, um, okay, well, but we have breakfast every Friday at the Hyatt, so at least join us for breakfast. So I said, okay, that would be fun. And it was sort of strange. I was the only woman, but they're this wonderful guys. They're still, to this day, my, my, my friends. We still have breakfast. All different disciplines? Yeah. And we still have breakfast on Fridays on occasion. Um, we've lost one member. Um, he died uh, last year. But, but anyway, one of, them, one of them's wife, one of, one of them... Was was be, was very into women's issues and was reading all kinds of things. And another one's wife um, was studying with uh, Carol Gilligan at Harvard, and so they would be talking about this stuff at breakfast. And 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 I remember reading Carol Gilligan's book uh, in a different voice. I think it was called back then. Anyway, and I started thinking, you know, some, something's registering here. And my colleague in the department was, I think he was kind of encouraging me to get, to get enlightened on, on what I was experiencing myself. And um, but I also sat in on Evelyn Fox Keller. She taught a seminar on um, her book, um, Gender, and, Gender and Science. Is that, I think that was the, the book then. I'm, not, and I, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Um, she had written a biography of Barbara McClintock, um, who won the Nobel Prize, and about her early studies and her early career. Anyway, so that experience kind of uh, sort of I realized what I was experiencing. And luckily, luckily, probably, I didn't realize it all the time I was working toward tenure because I w would have wasted a lot of energy on it. But, um, but that was when I think my feminist needle just went from here to here. And... Um, so that was that was just soon after I I got tenure. But so then fast forward. So the, you know I started reading and reading literature and realizing that that it was exhausting to be you know trying to keep up with the everything in the field at the same time. You know the micro inequities, the studies of of women having to be twice as good as men to achieve the same thing. And, the, you know, the double-blind studies of um, CVs showing the, exactly the same CV, if it's got a woman's name, will be judged, that candidate will be judged lesser and all of that. And, um, you know, you never quite believe it applies to you, but still it became, you know, I, I realized that this was something that I had to to really understand. And also I... I, I started working with the women graduate students to to help them you know uh, at least appreciate what was what was happening around them and um anyway so then fast forward to to uh Nancy calling and you know she she called all of us and said have you have you experienced you know any of this these things or or feeling that maybe you're not getting the same share of the pie as some of the, the men. And and you were? I mean, you well, weren't just reading about it. You were experiencing it? Well, not not tangibly. I mean, I, was like, you, you, I couldn't point to, you know, particular... Because I've always felt, you know, MIT has been very good to me. Um, uh, but I tend to look at the positive. And, 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 but I, I, I have... 
I, like my whole career. I mean, I feel MIT gave me my career, and I felt that I had been fairly treated. And um, you know, I certainly didn't have less space than other people. I think I probably had more space than other people. But but it's sort of a general sense of not being part of the club. You know, not just always being a little bit outside of, you know, noticing that I always described it as uh, there, you're, you're playing a game, like a football game or something, and they have the playbook and we don't. Um, and that's the way it felt, sort of, because you'd just be taken aback by learning, you know, some something that, some deal that was worked out or whatever. And, and so, but I never, you know, I never had in my own experience, couldn't, couldn't put my finger on anything, but it's just that general sense that, yeah, it's not the same playing field. It's not the same playing field. And, and you felt that study really made a difference in terms of well, yeah, Not I mean, just perceptions, the, the, but in reality, yeah, absolutely. And the the most exciting thing about that was the. First of all, I met other women faculty because there was like one of us in each department. You know, we didn't really know each other. That, but, but we all I'll, we'll never forget the first time we all got together, and everybody was. Kind of. Say not not wanting to look like the whiner, you know. I mean, we're, we're all accomplished, full professors at MIT. You know, we 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 made it. You know, we're not really, you know, shortchanged or anything. And then people started sharing stories, and before long, you know, a half hour went by, and we were all on the same page. And um, and it was just very, I don't know, it was just, it just you felt finally you, you you found your tribe kind of. <laughs> it was like, um, so, but then then the best thing about it was the response of the administration that they were so. They listened, you know, to the uh, Bob Bergino. I'll never forget the time we, we, we got an appointment. To, he was the dean at the time. And we all got together and we marched to his office, not, you know, expecting anything to happen. Um, because so many women at other universities have, have tried to launch, you know, some of these equity studies and things. And, and it just, you know, gets put in a filing cabinet or something. And and we all sat around his big conference table, and he listened, and um, he listened earnestly. And the same was, you know, Bob Brown and Chuck Vest. I mean, they were just. It, it was just, and I was very proud of MIT. I mean, it was just a really satisfying experience. Um, we felt, you know, we felt heard. And uh, then the, the the study and and changes were made, um, significant changes. And if you look at MIT now, I mean, just. It's amazing how, but it takes that constant vigilance, you know, to to keep to keep the numbers of women increasing. Um, so now, just to present day, the Chisholm Lab at MIT, students doing research there. Um, could you just talk about uh, what a, a typical day might be like at the lab and what work is going on, like now? <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm sort of embarrassed to have it called the Chisholm Lab. I mean, that that's the way, but that's, I mean, that's Your the lab. way, yeah, <laughs> that's the way we identify within the, you know, within the department, you know, there's the Poltz Lab and the Chisholm Lab and the whatever, but, um, Fair enough. but yeah, <laughs> but I mean, that's, I know that that's what it's called. Um, you probably should call it the Procore Caucus Lab, but anyway. Um, Chisholm's easier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, well, they do all the work. Um, uh, so a day in the lab, uh, we have people now, I mean, uh, people, we have lots of cultures that we're taking care of that we keep isolating more of. Um, and uh, Are you still going on cruises? I don't go, but the, but the students do. Um, and not, not a lot because we have freezers full of samples from all over the world and um, my what what I've worked on the last couple of years has got, gotten funding now to analyze all of these samples we're doing uh, metagenomics on all these samples and we're we can now do single cell genomics so we can grab a single prochlorococcus cell from a sample from all over the oceans 
um, and sequence its genome. Oh, we don't do it, but we can we send it to a facility. Um, so, so that's one big project we have going now. Is just you know I've decided there's several things I want to accomplish before I I don't say retire, but before I wind down. Um, and one is to to really nail down this pan genome uh, by se and and sequencing the the samples in our freezers that are across all these gradients of different oceans and different um, ocean characteristics. And so we can map Prochlorococcus genome content onto the, the traits of the different oceans and really understand what's driving their evolution and their diversity. And um, so that's a big project that we're doing now, which is funded by the, the Simons Foundation. And um, and the other thing I want, one, one thing that we can't do with Prochlorococcus is genetics. So if we want to understand the function of a certain gene, we're not able to knock that gene out, which is a standard tool in any kind of model system that anybody uses in the lab. And because it's been just incredibly recalcitrant to any kind of manipulation, it does not want us to mess with it. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's, and it doesn't evolve very fast in the lab. We've, we've resequenced 10 years later the same strain, and it, you know, it just doesn't change. Because I think it's just this tiny little cell with this tiny little genome, all of which is essential to it, and it doesn't want to be messed with. But we're working on it, So, because I, I think we need to be able to do genetics uh, in order, because my other goal is to have a lot of people adopt the system so that it will become sort of like, you know, E. coli is sort of the standard model microbe that people do a lot of molecular biology research on. So I want Prochlorococcus to be the model microbe for microbial ecology research and, and have a lot of people study it from a lot of different angles uh, so that it will live on and and be famous as it should. But in order to do that, I need, we need to crack the problem of being able to, you know, to do genetics with it so that we can manipulate it a little. Although that's um, what the viruses are doing, aren't they? That's what the viruses are doing, yes. But, uh, and then everybody says, why don't you use the viruses to do that? And, and I've had a couple people work on it and try, and it's, it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> and so now I have somebody working on it from a different angle, so um, so we're doing that, and um, and uh, I have a another. I always say Prochlorococcus is the gift that keeps on giving, um, because it 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 points us in the directions we should be going. I mean, we we don't really have to have ideas because it it's always showing us something that we should study, and and one of the recent things is that it makes uh, vesicles. It buds off these little lipid bound vesicles that that it puts out into the seawater and through studying Prochlorococcus doing that um, the postdoc working on that he went out in the ocean he said well if Prochlorococcus is doing that I wonder if other microbes in the oceans are doing it so he studied it in seawater and uh, lots of different bacteria are putting these little vesicles of uh, their packets of they have DNA in them they have RNA in them they have protein in them they have Little, all kinds of stuff. You talk about dissolved information. They're, um, you know, and they're trying to tell us something. We don't have any idea what their function is. Uh, so he's trying to carve away at that problem, which is, which is really challenging. And then the other thing that you'll find people working on if you walk into the lab is, um, is we're working on the bacteria that that they grow with. And it turns out Prochlorococcus, it took us years to get them free of, when you isolate them from the oceans, they're always heterotrophic bacteria, the ones that grow on carbon, they can't photosynthesize, that come along with them. And it, it, it's just been really difficult to separate them. But we finally figured out how to get them pure Prochlorococcus. And um, so now we're putting them back together to to try to understand what the conversation is, you know, why they didn't like to be separated. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on in that. So, and that's part of this co-evolved network of micro, I mean, we, we, we think that, that their metabolisms are very tightly linked. 
um, and they'll grow without each other. But, well, the heterotroph actually n needs the carbon that Prochlorococcus makes, but, um, but it's also fulfilling a role. Um, it's actually reducing oxidative stress in Prochlorococcus. So, so we're, we're trying to understand that, that pairwise combination. And of course, the, the big question is all of them out there and how they're all interconnected. And, uh, so you're not so. running out of things to do. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not, we are not running out of things to do. I'm going to switch gears a little and talk to you about the children's books. Ah. So if you could just tell us how that even came about that you were writing children's books. Well, and so, what about? <laughs> yeah, sure. The um, Molly, well, Molly Bang, who's the my co-author and she's the illustrator of these books, uh, is a friend, a friend of mine. She lives in Woods Hole. I've known her for a long time, probably thirty years, maybe. Um, and so I watched her, and she's an accomplished children's book writer and illustrator. And I watched her make these books over the years. And um, at the same time, <clears throat> I um, go have a drink. So at the same time, I um, was frustrated about how little people understand about how the earth works. And <clears throat> excuse me, there was a Harvard Smithsonian study of of where they of education, and they interviewed MIT and Harvard graduates at graduation day, and they said, here's a seed, here's a log. Where did the weight of this log come from? And none of them, at least none of them on the film, you can find this on the web, uh, said from the air, and uh, you know, not recognizing that photosynthesis is, is the basis of making biomass on, on, on Earth, and it's drawing carbon dioxide out of the air with, with solar energy, and that's what, that's what made this log from this seed. And, um, and also teaching intro, introductory biology class, um, you know, I, I recognize how little time is spent on, on photosynthesis, and so, so that's what, so, so I said, well, if we, if we write a children's book, you know, parents will read it. <laughs> <laughs> and at least ch and children will learn it, and parents will read it, and maybe they'll remember that they did learn it um, in the seventh grade but forgot. Uh, because I don't think that people can appreciate things like global warming and, and CO2 in the atmosphere and all of that if they don't understand the role of the biosphere in regulating um, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So, so that was kind of a, the motivation. And so... Um, so, you know, Molly and I decided to write the first book, um, and uh, which is on photosynthesis on land. And by the time we finished that, you know, had left out the phytoplankton. I said, we we got to do the phytoplankton. So the second book was, is photosynthesis in the oceans. And then the, the third book is called Buried Sunlight. And then that's about fossil, fossil carbon, fossil fuel, and how long it took to bury it and the problems with burning it now. So... Which I'd like to talk about more as well. Have you taken a stand in uh, in terms of um, global warming and the that whole issue? Uh, have you spoken out on environmental issues? Have there been things that your research has led you to want to communicate with the general public about? Well, other than my my, I mean, the children's books, you know, are I feel strongly about. Um, helping the general public understand the basics of how the earth works. I, I feel that if they understand that, they will make sound choices about things like <laughs> global warming and things like that. So that's my top priority. Um, the only thing that I've been pretty outspoken about is, is geoengineering, which is the proposals. And it started with the, uh, it started with the, proposal that we, uh, the geoengineering proposal that we might fertilize the oceans to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. And um, that emerged from, I was involved in one of the, in, in the, in actually the first ocean fertilization experiment that was a scientific experiment. It was funded by NSF and it was designed to 
to study whether iron limited phytoplankton growth in the oceans. And um, it was a very small scale experiment. And we were out there studying Prochlorococcus response to this added nutrient. And pardon me, but why iron? Well, it turns out that iron can be the limiting factor for phytoplankton because in some regions of the oceans. Um, and in those regions, there's lots of nitrogen and phosphorus around. And everybody wondered why isn't, what, and those are usually considered the limiting factors, um, just like in your house plants when you fertilize them with uh, miracle Grow or something. Um, and so people wondered, well, why aren't the phytoplankton using all that nitrogen and phosphorus in those regions? Because there's other reasons where it's just sucked down to nothing. And it, the hypothesis was because in those regions, it's actually iron that's limiting. And that if you add the iron, the phytoplankton can use all that nitrogen and phosphorus, and then they'll bloom. And so to test that hypothesis, um, which is, is a attributed to John Martin, who actually was a close friend and colleague of mine, um, which is how we ended up on that cruise. Um, what, what the idea was to just make a small, tiny patch of iron-enriched waters out in the equatorial Pacific and, um, and see if that created a, a bloom. Well, the, the press got a hold of that, and, and, and I, I have to say John Martin had encouraged this interpretation by saying, give me a tank, tanker of iron and I'll give you an ice age, um, uh, suggesting that you could fertilize the ocean, you know, broadly fertilize the oceans and draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and cool the earth. Um, and there was some evidence from paleo-oceanography that maybe this had happened, you know, in the Earth's history. Anyway, so... So entrepreneurs got a hold of this, and, and there were these proposals to commercialize ocean fertilization to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and have the phytoplankton suck it up and settle to the bottom of the ocean, and, you know, that that would, that would ward off global warming. And, and so that, I started, I wrote a couple of articles saying, you know, that this is just a, just a, not a good idea. And again, people were people were ignoring all the unintended side effects of doing something like that. Um, so, so I've been pretty outspoken about uh, cures that are worse than the disease. Um, and uh, what concerns about the changes in pH in the ocean are there? Um, yes. Well, I'm. I mean, I'm. You know, like everybody, I'm concerned about the trajectory that we're on, um, that, I mean, which is why another reason, you know, I, I, I wrote the third children's book, um, not that children ha can do anything about it, but their parents will read it. Um, and it just very simply, uh, points out how long it took to, to bury that fossil fuel. And that when you, most of our environmental problems, a lot of them can, that boil down to us doing, uh, accelerating processes that are that are natural processes, but but the Earth isn't equipped to handle them at the rates that we make things happen. And um, I think if people understand that, they will think more carefully about the choices that we make. But I don't get involved in in political activism and all of that. Um, what uh, do you still teach at graduate and undergraduate? Levels, just then? just undergraduate. Undergrad. Yeah. yeah. And why is that important to you? Oh, uh, I, I love the MIT undergraduates. Um, they, and I, I, I think they're the most interesting kids. <laughs> um, they're really, uh, they're all, I shouldn't call them kids, young, young people. Um, but they're, they're all individuals and they're all, uh, multifaceted, and I enjoy teach. I teach part of one of the institute core biology classes, so I enjoy uh, bringing the ecology message to to those students. Since ecology is not very visible on the MIT campus, in fact, there's only one class uh, in ecology, um, which is is was the one I've been teaching for 38 years um, in our department, and um, so I, 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 I'm, I enjoy 
at least having that exposure to a large number of, of the undergraduates to show them that there's this scientific field called ecology where, you know, it's a strict natural science and we, we actually, you know, do experimental work and there's all this exciting genomics going on. And, uh, and all different so, disciplines. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I've managed over the years to, to seduce a few of them to going into the field because I think it could benefit from some of their, their talent. Um, and if you um, you've won some wonder been awarded uh, wonderful awards, and I wondered if you want to reflect on the three most recent ones at all: the National Science Medal, Killian Faculty Achievement Award, and your appointment as MIT Institute Professor in the aggregate. Or it, it, it did one, you know, was, was there anything about any of them that was particularly striking and defining and? <laughs> Well, oh, yeah, they were, they were overwhelming, um, I think. And I credit, I always, I credit Prochlorococcus and, and all of these incredibly bright MIT graduate students and the postdocs I've had um, for, you know, I, I feel, I always say I must have done something, but I feel <laughs> sort of unworthy of it because it's really the team, the team of these bright people. I always say if, 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 my, if you took my career and you put it somewhere else, I don't think it would have culminated in this. But, um, but I do take credit for, you know, keeping the, keeping the focus, keeping the direction. Being the conductor and, of the orchestra. Yeah, being the conductor of the orchestra and recognizing, you know, years ago that, that if we focused on Prochlorococcus, it had a lot of really interesting things to tell us. So, but the National Medal of Science was just, uh, uh, that was a real shock because uh, I, it, it, I, it, mo mostly because my field has always been a little bit backwatery, you know, so it wasn't even something that was on my, my radar screen at all. And um, so that was a shock, and, and the, um, the, you know, I'm still not, I still, have, still haven't quite embraced the idea. But, um, and the Killian Award was just really, really, I felt, incredibly grateful. I mean, how lucky can you be to kind of have that toward the end of your career? Es especially, again, because, um, you know, my my field and I've always been a little bit an oddball at MIT, you know. I, I mean, I, I'm a biologist in an engineering department and so... And thinking big and small was also um, used to, as part of your praise, that you think both big and small. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, and I guess that's I guess I will take credit for for that, even though, you know, I never could have done it uh, without without these incredible students. That because I I remember distinctly going and talking to uh, Gabrielle Rocap. She was the one who stewarded the stewarded the genome, and I said. Gabriel, we could get this sequence, this genome sequence. And I said, I'm not doing it without you. <laughs> I said, are you in? And she said, oh, sure. You know, no problem. So uh, it, 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 you know, that they have sort of had my back all the way along. Um, and so I feel very, very lucky to, to have had all of them. And, and the institute professor, again, <laughs> that was just a total, not something I ever imagined would happen. So, so I'm feeling very grateful and, and very lucky at this point. Good. Um, and now looking more broadly, we're looking at the MIT's 100th uh, anniversary of moving to Cambridge from Boston. And you've been on the faculty for about a third of that 100 years. How <laughs> have MIT, well, many of us have been around that long. How have MIT and Cambridge, would you think, at, at, in your estimation, impacted each other during that time? Do you have some thoughts about that. Wow. I have never thought of it that way. <laughs> I've been here a third of the time. Oh, my God. Um, well, it's been enormous change, obviously. I remember, I remember when I first came to interview. I stayed in a hotel in Harvard Square and took the subway here, got off in Kendall Square, had coffee at the F&T Delicatessen, which was this, you know, little train car. And with sawdust on the floor, and that was all there was around here. You know, I was sitting there waiting till my appointment, um, and the the whole area on this side of campus was, you know, just nothing. And um, 
so over the years, I, you know, I've watched all the biotech industry grow up and all of the buildings around our building, the Stata Center and the McGovern, all, you know, all of the <laughs> molecular biology in our building is still the same building sitting there. Um, so, yeah, so the enormous changes in the, in the, in the campus and the, you know, the industry. I, I guess that the biotech industry is just extra, enormous. Um, and again, an interesting thing to watch in the context of, of our field. And um, so we don't have any uh, products. We don't have any, we don't have any. Uh, Manufacturing. Yeah, we don't have any patents and companies and all of that. Uh, but, uh, but I always say, but we have exciting questions. So, um, so yeah, I think for, for me, I've never lived in Cambridge, so the influence on the, on the rest of it, but certainly uh, it's, it's a totally different world. So then any other, any thoughts about, um, you've talked about um, current projects which leading into future dreams, any, Anything else about um, challenges for marine biology and genomics for the future or the legacy of your work or any just as you look ahead, um, what are your final thoughts about what, where this could go? <laughs> well, as I look, yeah, as I look ahead um, from my own point of view, my own, my own goals, as I said, would be to have Prochlorococcus uh, have a home in many, many different labs around the around the country um, and and also selfishly I would like its 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 primary home to be MIT so I would uh, you know I would hope that sometime you know that we might have another faculty member who works on it but I don't know um, because I have as I say <laughs> I have freezers full of uh, of samples and, and cultures and, and and also I just think it's 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 only begun to it's only begun to show us the exciting things that we could learn from it. But so whether it stays here or, or is uh, expands to other places. I mean, I, the, the, some of my former students and postdocs are already carrying the torch. But I think I need a lot more to get a lot more established out there. And um, but I also see. I mean, I see exciting times um, for a s s sort of a coming together of, of the, the field of biology um, years ago when I first came here was, was completely split between cellular and molecular biology and ecology and evolution. And slowly but surely uh, they, are start, they have been marching together in large part because of genomics um, and, and microbial molecular ecology. And so I guess what what really excites me is would excite me would be uh, to see that really come together in what's sometimes called the new biology, where we where we see that you can't just study organisms in 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 the in isolation that they're they're part of they're all part of communities of organisms they're all in an ecosystem and they're all shaped by the environment in which they evolve and. We're learning that now in human health with there's this huge initiative on the human microbiome, studying the, the bacteria all over our bodies and the influence that those ecological community, we are an ecosystem. We are, there's no doubt about it. Um, so I think, you know, over the next decade that the field of biology will start to be transformed into a much more integrative um, at the sand, on the one hand, you have um, biological engineering and, and synthetic biology where people are working on making life from scratch. Um, and on the other hand, I think we'll have uh, people studying ecosystems as, as, as living systems that can be understood in, a, in an entirely new way. So it's going to be a really exciting time, I think. And I hope to be around to see it. <laughs> That's an excellent way to end, unless you have any other thoughts? No, just uh, again to express my gratitude to MIT, because um, it's been a great place to me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for giving Thank us you. this time. Thank you. <laughs>